fingers.
Today, we want to talk a little bit about the fact that Jesus goes to church. And uh, he did that on a consistent basis as we, to use our vernacular with that. He worshiped God. He worshiped his Father. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, a little bit tonight. So, we'll get everybody in. Uh, let's pray together and we'll get started tonight. Father, we're grateful for the Lord's Day. Thank you for the privilege of being together with people that we love so much. We're grateful for what we share because we are Christians. And we pray, Holy God, that what we've offered to you this morning in our worship period, what we will offer you now as we worship you through studying the Bible together, we pray you be acceptable in your eyes. We think about your son Jesus who provided an example for us in everything that is good and right. And as we think today about what was the custom in his life and making sure that he devoted time offer his praise and devotion to you. We pray that we will learn well from that. We pray you'll be with all who in our building meet this afternoon. Help us, Father, to think carefully about truth tonight and make observations of your right and truth. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we we said, we call this Jesus goes to church. Jesus goes to church. We use that we use that, that, that uh, language very commonly, don't we? So it was, yeah, it's, good. it's almost time to go to church. We know what we mean by that. What do we? By, what do we mean by that? By the way, so it's almost time to go to church. What do we mean? Worship, worship God. Yeah, it's it's time for us to go and <clears throat> for us to offer our worship to God. Let me ask you to use that language that we use very commonly about going to church. Why do folks go to church? Why do folks go to church? There can be a lot of different answers to that. Give me give me a reason why folks sometimes go to church. Worship collectively with other Christians. All right, so Don's going to go right to the really good answer. That's the, that's the, let's, let's make sure we get credit for that. That's, that's the good right answer, right? Because we want to worship collectively our God. And that's, that, of course, is the, is the purpose. That is the, the right answer. Why else would somebody maybe go to church? To be seen by others. Well, maybe to seen by others. And, and maybe, maybe the point of that is because of pressure. You know, we have, I wonder... If we're not there, you know, our parents will get on to us, our grandparents get on to us, uh, others might get on to us, and so, you know, we we got we got to go make an appearance. We got to be there so they can see that we're there, and not 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 a great not a great motive. Why else? Why else? Be with friends yeah. and family. Yeah, sometimes for because you want to be with friends and family, <clears throat> just kind of the fellowship of that. Your friends you hear, you enjoy being with them. We enjoy the people that are there, uh, and. You know, that's certainly an aspect of this. If it is the primary aspect, then something's 
a skew, but that's certainly a, a part of that. Why else? Check the box. Sometimes you check the box. Check the box and knows what we're supposed to do. Wouldn't feel right if we did. It's what kind of what we've all grown up doing. It's what we Sunday wouldn't be Sunday if we don't do that. <clears throat> and so it's it's possible sometimes to just check the what's another word for that, by the way? Habit. Pardon me? Habit maybe? Habit. Habit. It's habit is an interesting word because we always talk about habit as though it's a bad thing. We give habit a totally negative connotation. And it shouldn't. It shouldn't have a negative connotation. So now you can do something out of habit, which means you're just doing it by rote, checking a box without thinking about what you're doing. And that certainly has a negative connotation to it. But habit can have a very good connotation to it. How so? Well, this habit helps you reset for the following week. Yeah, exactly. That week. Yeah, <clears throat> because it's something you ought to do. I mean, there are a lot of habits that we have that are really good, aren't they? I mean, I, I brush my teeth a couple of times. That's a pretty good habit to have, you know? Uh, you're welcome. You're very welcome. Very welcome. If you're, if you're not doing that, that's a good habit for you to develop, by the way. You might want to, might want to <clears throat> work that in. So it, it's not always bad. And it, it's interesting, in the passage we're going to read in a moment in Luke chapter 4, it says about Jesus, he went to synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom, or another word for custom, habit. as was his habit. And so it can be used in a very positive way about worship as well. We sometimes don't, we sometimes don't, don't think about, think about it that way. There are a lot of reasons why individuals might, might go to church, to, to use our language. Of course, the, the best reason is this. Oh, come, let's worship and bow down. Let's kneel before the Lord our Maker. He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture. And in those, in that, in those two simple verses, you just have a boatload of meaning. There are just a lot of layers of wonderful meaning right there. That worship is a place where we come to express uh, or to experience the presence of God. It is, it's, it's where we come to acknowledge God's authority over us. He is our God. We are His people. His people. So we, we acknowledge His authority and where we pledge our commitment to be, to be obedient to Him. Let us come and worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our what? Our Maker. Our Maker. And so I mean just lots of layers in those <clears throat> two very simple verses. If I were to ask you to, to define for me, define for me the word worship how would you define it? We use that word all the time. So how would you define worship? Another word that's interchangeable with worship is adore. Adore. So adoration. <clears throat> adoration. What else? How would you define worship? Bowing down. Pardon me? Bowing down. Bowing down. That's, and that's exactly what he says. Let us worship and bow down. And so there is, there is <clears throat> people bow down to God both literally and figuratively, don't they, sometimes in worship. And so, what else? What else? What else? Uh, two define? characteristics of worship are participation and community. Participation and community, that's right. Participation and community, you cannot worship without engaging your mind in some action of thought or word. That's exactly right. <clears throat> and in the New Testament, worship oftentimes was in community. We certainly can worship. We can engage in, in worship of God individually, but in the New Testament, most often it was collectively. The Bible talks about our being together. When you are together, when you are gathered together, what else? How would you define the word worship? Reverence. Pardon me? Reverence. Reverence. Reverence is a good way of, <clears throat> of looking at that. Uh, reverence is a little bit different than adoration. Reverence speaks to an attitude toward... God the maker and him being God and understanding the relative positions of God and man. We're, he's God. We, we, are, we are not. Bruce? <clears throat> Giving homage to one who is worthy. Giving homage to one who is worthy. And so there's acknowledgement of God's worth. Worship, in many ways, is worth-ship. Acknowledging his worth. And so <clears throat> that certainly would be a, a part of that. 
those are, those are all excellent. Those are all excellent ways of looking at that. <clears throat> in the New Testament, in your New Testament that you have in your hand tonight, <clears throat> there are there are several words that <clears throat> are translated by the one English word worship. So we have worship, one word, but in the New Testament there are five different words that are used that are just that are translated by that one word worship. And they all have just a little bit different nuance to them. And <clears throat> so let's just let's just talk about them here for for just a second. Hoskunal uh, is means to kiss, and it means to express reverence. Uh, I remember hearing, I remember hearing when I was young <clears throat> in a sermon, uh, a preacher saying, you know, this this is kind of like a dog licking its master's hand, and it, it offended me. I thought that is the most offensive thing I've ever heard. And then, as I've gotten older, I've realized, you know, what <laughs> what that's saying is just an absolutely unfiltered love, an unfiltered kind of love and reverence, expressing expressing reverence. And so, not infrequently in the New Testament, uh, that reverence was expressed, what did the psalmist say? Let us come and do what? Can I remember? Bow down. Let us bow down. And oftentimes that's the way that reverence was expressed. <clears throat> that's the way the devil used it in Matthew 4 and 9 with Jesus. The devil said to Jesus, all these things will I give you if you will fall down and worship me. This is the word that he uses here. To fall down. Fall down and, <clears throat> and worship me. In uh, 1 Corinthians 14, Paul said, thus the secrets of his hearts are revealed. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. Now we're going we're gonna to see this later in our, in our study. <clears throat> but in, in this place, he's talking about an unbeliever. There's an unbeliever who comes into your assembly, and he witnesses your worship. He sees what you do in homage to God and the way that you act and worship. <clears throat> you know, if he doesn't understand anything else, he'll understand about how important that is, and he will fall down on his face and worship God. <clears throat> this is this, this word of expressing, of expressing reverence, expressing reverence. Uh, there's another word, the second word, <clears throat> the second word, Eusebia, and it indicates adoration and devotion. This was the word that was used by Paul in Acts chapter 17 when he is in Athens, and when he's invited to go to the Areopagus and speak to the, that impressive group of men there, <clears throat> he says, as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, and therefore the one whom you worship without knowing him I proclaim to you. And so this is the word for adoration or devotion. And he said, I, I observe the objects of your adoration, the things that you are devoted to. <clears throat> and then, of course, he uses that as a, as a bridge to say, I want to talk to you about the one that you should adore and the one that you should, that you should be uh, devoted to. By the way, just a little side note here. You might want to jot in your margin, 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. <clears throat> 1 Timothy 4, verses 7 and 8. Uh, in 1 Timothy 4, 7, Paul said that we should exercise ourselves toward godliness. Is the way it's almost always translated in our English Bibles. But the word godliness there is this word for worship. And he's saying we need to exercise ourselves toward adoration and devotion of God. And in that context, he says, if you, if you look, think about the context of 1 Timothy 4, <clears throat> verses 5 through about verse 10, the way that you show that adoration and devotion to God is by the way you live your life. And so he talked about study of God's word, and obedience, he talked about teaching, he talked about setting an example, he talked about diligence. And in that context, he's saying, what you're doing in that is showing your adoration and devotion to God. Exercise yourselves unto literally worship. It's translated godliness because it to us in the context it makes more sense that way. But the word literally is the word for worship here. <clears throat> there's a there's a third word. There's a third word, triskia. And triskia refers to the external kind of ceremonial aspects of religion. <clears throat> this is the word 
the Jews where we study this morning in James chapter 1. We didn't talk about these verses this morning. Where James says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. So <clears throat> if the word here, the word if anyone thinks he is religious, that's the word for worship. If anyone among you thinks he is worshiping but does not bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and his worship is useless. So if worship in this place means an external ceremonial aspect of religion, and he says, if you think you are worshiping, but you're not bridling your tongue, what, what's he saying there? How would we put that into 2022 language? Somewhat hypocritical. On the outside, you, it looks good, but on the inside, it's, it's not good. And what, what would look good? What would look good? The external ceremonial aspects. If you think you're worshiping, <clears throat> what what would we identify as worship in that context today? What do we do when we come together on Sundays? Sing. So we sing, and we pray, and we commune, and we give, and we study, and teach. And so James is saying, look, if you're coming together on Sunday, if you're coming together on Sunday, and you're singing, and praying, and teaching, and you're giving, and you're doing all those things, and you think that's worship, but you're not bridling your tongue. Uh, <clears throat> your religion is, is useless. In that same context, he talks about visiting the fatherless and the widows. And he talks about keeping yourself unspotted from the world. And so in essence, he says, look, if you come together on Sunday and you're, you're doing all the right things, but you're not keeping yourself unspotted from the world and you don't have any compassion, empathy toward others, you're not kind toward others, and you haven't learned to control your tongue, you can call it worship, doesn't mean it is. That's what he's saying. You can call it worship, doesn't mean that's actually what <clears throat> it is. And so that becomes extremely important, I think, for us to for us to understand. For us to understand. There's a fourth word. <clears throat> the fourth word is sabo. And it means to worship in ador an adoring way. And so in Acts 18, <clears throat> He departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice. And Justice was one who worshipped God. And it just means that he, he worshipped, he adored God. And it's the one place in the New Testament, or the only place I think in the New Testament, that that word <coughs> is, is used. And then there's one more word. <coughs> and that's the word latrigal. And we get our word litur uh, uh, liturgy from that. It's used, it's used to describe it about bringing a gift. Um, a priest who would offer a gift to God, an offering to God. And so in Acts 24, when Paul is kind of given an overview of his life and faith, his conversion, what it means to him to be a Christian, <clears throat> here's what he said. I confess to you that according to the way, which they call a sect, what, what is that by the way? The way folks were calling a sect. Yeah, that's Christianity. So he said, I confess to you that according to the way that they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And so Paul says, I, <clears throat> I am worshiping, I'm worshiping God this way. But what did Paul offer to God? You know, I mean, we, we could say, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure that I'm, I'm sure that he prayed and he sang and he, and he offered and he communed. But, but what, did, what did Paul offer to God first and foremost? Pardon me? Who said that? Somebody. I'm sorry. What did you say, Ariel? Himself. Himself. He offered himself. Yeah. And in this context, I think that's probably what he's saying. <clears throat> the, the gift that I'm offering God is my life. And my goodness, if you want to see that clearly spelled out, just read what he said in the Corinthians, to the Corinthians about what he suffered as a Christian, what he went through as a Christian. What was that? Yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's what he said in Romans 12. <clears throat> you need to present your body a living sacrifice, holy and <clears throat> acceptable to God. And so, <coughs> so you have these, you have these, uh, you have these, these five words. I, I read an article a couple of weeks ago <clears throat> by my friend Tech Shumby. I gave this to Carrie as well. Uh, 
Tech Shumley wrote a great article a couple of weeks ago, and he made the observation. He said, you know, we talk about, we talk about the acts of worship. And when we talk about the acts of worship, we know what we're talking about, don't we? We're, we're talking about praying and singing and giving and communion and <clears throat> teaching we, we, when we talk about the acts of worship. But he made the observation that nowhere in the New Testament are those things identified as worship. You ever thought about that? That there's no place in the New Testament that it ever says, by the way, singing is worship. Eating the Lord's Supper is worship. It, it doesn't call on those things. Why do you suppose that the New Testament doesn't specify those five things that we talk about as being the acts of worship? And I believe they are. I'm not arguing with that at all. I, I think they are our acts of worship. But why don't you think the New Testament would ever identify them specifically and say, by the way, <clears throat> those things are acts of worship? Why do you think it, it doesn't do that? Yes, sir? The acts of worship are of the heart. Because they're of the heart, okay? Not, not they, the checklist or anything. It's not a checklist. They're, they're outward expressions of the heart, obviously. Yes? I would say it's not true worship. True worship is what happens outside the building and how you live your life every day. And by extension of that, that true worship, then that's where you start. And then the outward... Um, the yeah, outward showing of that is that singing and praying. But the singing and praying, it doesn't start there and then go outwards. It's outside the building and then goes to the building, if you get what I'm saying. <clears throat> There's certainly a tie to what we do outside of the building with what we do in the building. It's just, it's a, go back to what James said in James 1 a moment ago. If, we're, <clears throat> if we are not living any semblance of a Christian life outside the building, it's very difficult to come in the building, flip a switch, and offer genuine heartfelt worship. It doesn't, it just doesn't happen. <clears throat> but, but I think there's another reason, Kim? <clears throat> there's other things that are, I mean, those are acts of worship, but that there's a lot of things that are worship, especially like bringing gifts, other things that we do to God that we can worship, so not to tie it into these. Right, worship, <clears throat> like there's lots that's a great observation, that worship is a broader umbrella than sometimes we tend to think of, that's a, <clears throat> That's a great point. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> Bruce? You can do all those things without your heart being right. That's it. Because, <clears throat> I think the reason is, because they may be worship, or they may not be worship. I mean, you can sing your heart out. Doesn't mean it's worship. You can, you, you can contribute. You can lay behind store. It doesn't mean it's worship. You can take communion. Doesn't mean you're worshiping. Doesn't mean you're worshiping. I, <clears throat> I, uh, <clears throat> I was sitting in the back of our building <clears throat> one Sunday morning, and, uh, and I forget why I was back there, but I, I ended up in the back, and I was probably going to sleep through Jonathan's sermon or something. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and I'm sitting, you know, because we're, we're packed in back there, and the person next to me, it was a, it was a and no offense to the young people here, but it was, it was a young people. It was a young people. <clears throat> and uh, so we're doing the Lord's Supper. And they're on their phone, and they're flipping through Instagram, and they just constantly, and when they got, this was back still when we passed the emblems, so when they got hit in the arm with the tray, they stopped, took it, and then they went, they kept flipping it until the next tray came by. Well, I don't, want, don't mean to judge anybody's heart here, but it's hard to believe there's a lot of worship going on there. So I think, I think that's probably the, the, the reason why there. I want you to think about this. Statement of Matthew 2 2. So they asked, they asked, they said, Where is born the king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And the marginal note in the New American Standard Bible says, the Greek word denotes an act of reverence, what he rather made to a creature. This is Genesis 4 9 the temptation. I'll give all this to you if you'll bow down and worship me. Or the creator. You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So worship and service are tied, are tied together. And that's, that's, that's a great definition. <clears throat> this act of reverence pay, in our case, to the, to the creator. To the creator. And so worship is an act of reverence. Well, there are a lot of things that we do that are acts of reverence to God. When we assemble together, we sing we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. We study the things that God wants us to observe, teach them to observe all things that I have commanded you. 
Uh, we remember the Lord's death by, by observing the supper. Uh, and when we do those things, out of reverence, out of adoration, offering that as a gift to God, then it can truly be said to be worship. Worship. And the point of, of going through all that is <clears throat> that I think sometimes we, we, we sometimes see things in very narrow focus. And there is a much bigger perspective. There's a reason why the New Testament, it's not just arbitrary, there's a reason why the New Testament will use different words to describe different aspects of what's involved in worship God. Because it wants us to have that complete picture of what we are doing <clears throat> when we when we when we serve our <clears throat> when we serve our God. Now with all that being said, okay, with all that <clears throat> being said, it would seem to me that that from those five words, we would get two responses. One is a sense of awe. Just a, a sense of awe as we bow before God. And so Isaiah said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. He would say, my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When you read Isaiah 6, it is impossible to read that and not understand that when Isaiah saw himself in comparison contrast to the God of heaven that he was filled with awe. Right? He, he, talks, he talks about God and he said that, that the train of his garment filled, filled the heavens. That is just incomparable. And so there, there is that sense of awe. But then there's also a sense of, of joy. A sense of joy in worship. Because we're not worshiping an impersonal, terrifying force that we have to be scared to death to come into his presence, right? <clears throat> we're, we're worshiping a faithful God of grace and love who did everything that he could to save us. And so we should be able to come into his presence with some joy. So I ask you to open to Psalm 100. Boy, that took a while to get to, didn't it? <laughs> Psalm 100. <clears throat> so here's how the psalmist talked about that in Psalm 100. He said, Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lambs. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is, what's the word? Good. The Lord is good. And his mercy is everlasting. And his truth endures to all generations. It's interesting that when you, when you read so many of the, of the Psalms of David, they're just, they're just like this. Where he talks about coming to the presence of God <clears throat> with gratitude, with joy, with singing, with enthusiasm. With, with all those things that ought to that ought to characterize that ought to characterize our worship. And when you think about that, we need, to, we need to, sometimes I have to ask myself, is this is this the way I'm approaching God? Is this the way that I'm coming before God? Yeah. Don? Don, there are times that I have to admit that one of the big reasons I come to church is for the encouragement. And spring that I can't that I can't get it anywhere else except for fellow Christians who are worshiping God. And it goes back to that joy that we can. Yeah, absolutely nothing wrong with that. It's one of the reasons that we do come together. You know, <clears throat> I was in built before I ever realized that there was a verse before Hebrews ten twenty five. I mean, I, I heard Hebrews ten twenty five on a regular basis growing up, and uh, I never heard anybody talk about Hebrews ten twenty four. Which, which talks about what we do together, what we get from that when we, when we come together. We'll, we'll say something about that in just a minute. So, in this, in this class, we want to talk about Jesus going to church. So, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4. Here's, here's this story in Luke, in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus, Jesus goes to the synagogue. So, in Luke 4, and beginning in verse... 
16. Let's just let's read several verses together here. Luke 4, verse 16 again. So Jesus came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And look at this. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, and he stood up to read. He was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. It, it wouldn't have been a book. What would it have been? It would have been scrolls. It would have been, <clears throat> so he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And it wouldn't have been just one scroll. There would have been three scrolls for Isaiah. It's a long, long book. So he's handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the scroll, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. Let's, let's stop there for just, a, <clears throat> for just a second. How does this, by the way, how does this story end in Luke 4? They said, well, now that was interesting. Thank you for reading for us today. We're so honored you come back home. This is our local boy made good. <laughs> yeah, they tried to kill him. They tried to kill him. Uh, yeah. They, uh, they took him. They were going to throw him over a cliff. This is the only place, and there may have been others, that we're not aware of. This is the only place that I'm aware of that Jesus used miraculous ability for himself. Hi. Can anybody think of any other place? Karen? I, you... I did the other day. What did John... Is there? Where he is, where he kind of, they wanted to get him. Mm -hmm. I kind of, so I just found it by accident. I did not check it out. Okay. But, uh, All right. But uh, there was one other place I saw in John. Well, if you were checking me out what I was going to say tonight, that's some good prophetic ability. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell you, we, 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 need, we need to talk about some other things. Yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, Jesus didn't use his miraculous abilities on a continual basis for himself, but he, he saves himself here. Because they take him, they're going to throw him over a cliff. They're going to kill him. <clears throat> but that's that's really because of what comes on later in the story. For our purposes tonight, here's here's what I want us to to see. Um, several years ago, I preached a sermon out of this passage, <clears throat> and I, I made the observation that <clears throat> that first of all, Jesus found his way home. He went he went back to he went back to Nazareth. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought. Uh, um, I, that's always been fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me that God Almighty gave the world a spin and decided that His Son was going to be born, was going to grow up, not be born, but grow up in Nazareth. Because Nazareth was a, a nothing community. I mean, it was, a, <clears throat> it was a wide spot in the road. It still is. I mean, it's, it's not a very big city now. In, in the Bible lands, but Nazareth was, now you could you could see from Nazareth where some Bible events took place, but nothing happened in Nazareth, <clears throat> to the point that in John chapter 1, when they say we, we have found him of whom Moses and the prophets spake, he is Jesus of Nazareth, what was the, what was the response? Yeah, can any good thing, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? That's why when I was at Florida College, we named the cafeteria Nazareth. Nothing, <laughs> nothing good came out of that place ever. Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Well, something good did come out of Nazareth. Someone good did come out of Nazareth. This, and it's interesting that Jesus goes back home. He goes back. He goes back where, where he grew up. Now, we said a minute ago that this homecoming doesn't end well for Jesus. And this is where, <clears throat> this is where Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor, except what? In his own country, among his own kin. And that's, you know, there's still, there's still some truth in that. There's still some truth in that. I always, always tell young preachers who, who want to go back home and preach, are invited to go back and be the preacher at their home congregation where they grew up. I always just say, you know, you need to listen to Jesus about that. Uh, that, that. That probably will not work out well. But he found his way home, and then he found his way to God's people. <clears throat> he found his way to God's people. He goes to the synagogue where he knows God's people are going to be. That's important. God's people. God's people are great people. God's people are wonderful people. 
God's people are not perfect people. In fact, I've never met anybody among God's people who claim to be perfect. We all acknowledge our failures. We all acknowledge that we're not perfect. We've got areas we need to work on. But I tell you, God's people see the value of gathering together and praying together and worshiping, <clears throat> worshiping together. And Jesus saw the value of that as well. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't just a matter of, you know, I, I'll go to synagogue. I don't have anything better to do on on Shabbat, and I'll, I'll go. I'll go. Guess I'll go to synagogue today. That that wasn't it at all. It, it was an understanding. This is this is where he needed to be. Now, he needed to be there. We'll talk about it in just a minute because this is this is what the Father wanted. He wanted Jesus said, the "Father wants people to worship him." But it was also it was also the privilege of being with the people of God. The privilege of being with people of God. I got to tell you. It doesn't sit well with me when I hear people disparaging the people of God. It just doesn't. There's a there's a whole thread going on social media right now, of just denigrating the people of God. And I'm gonna tell you, it, it does not sit well with me at all. And I don't I don't see I don't see my brethren that way. I don't see my brethren that way, <clears throat> that way at all. And then third, Jesus found the place where it was written. So it says that he stood up to read. You can read between the lines there. He wouldn't have just he wouldn't have just done that. I mean, he was he was a special guest. He was the you know everybody had heard about Jesus in Nazareth, and he comes home. And so they asked him to read. This was this is what you did with special guests in the synagogue. So they invite him. <clears throat> they invite him to read. I want you to look in verse uh, yeah look at verse seventeen. He was handed the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the scroll, he found the place where. It was written. I find that interesting. That he he found the place where it was written and then he read. Did he have to do that? Why not? He wrote it. He wrote it. <laughs> he wrote it. He could have, you know, he could have just said, you know, I was thinking about the thinking about the scrolls of Isaiah. And I remember when the Father of the Holy Spirit and I, when we inspired Isaiah to write these words, he could have done it that way. But, but he didn't. And it's kind of interesting that he, you know, he knew where to open the, he knew where to open scrolls and, and find these words. He knew what he, <clears throat> what he wanted to read, as he, uh, as he reads to them from, from Isaiah. He knew what he was looking for. Uh, every time I read that, I think about, I think about the fact, I think about, how many times have you heard a Christian <laughs> say, you know, I know the Bible says this somewhere, uh, and then oftentimes what they quote, the Bible didn't say. The Bible didn't say. I mean, how many times have you heard someone say, I, you know what? You know, the Bible says somewhere, <clears throat> the, the, the Bible says somewhere that everything happens for a reason. <laughs> no, it doesn't either. It doesn't. It doesn't. It doesn't say that either. Or, you know, the Bible, the Bible says, uh, the Bible says somewhere that to err is human and to forgive divine. <laughs> no, it, it doesn't. It, it doesn't. The Bible says somewhere, you know, that cleanliness is next to godliness. <laughs> Unless you have a teenager, and then it's next to impossible. Uh, the, 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 the Bible says somewhere that God helps those who help themselves. No, it really doesn't. It really doesn't. Now, you may find some of those principles somehow, some way, in some verses, and maybe piece them together, but it doesn't say those things. Sometimes we, uh, those are, you may know what those are called, by the way. There's a name for those kind of little things. Aphorisms? Adages? Close. But on Jeopardy, you don't get credit for that. Cliches. <laughs> cliches? No, they're not called cliches. They're Adages. called Adages? No, thanks for playing, though. <laughs> Anybody else? They're called chimney corner scriptures. <laughs> they're called chimney corner scriptures. I don't know why I remember that. I heard that years and years ago. And uh, I don't know why they're called that. I just remember they're called chimney, chimney corner scriptures. All right? So, Carson? <clears throat> my intern, I want you to find out for Wednesday night why they're called Chimney Corner Scriptures. Thanks. Man, it's great having an intern. <laughs> Would y'all like for Carson to do anything? I can do <laughs> Anybody need your car washed, waxed? All right. So Jesus, the, the point of that is, you know, and what Luke is saying is that Jesus knew the book. He was a person of the book. Here's the, here's the key. Here's the key. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. 
as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now here's my question. Why would he, why would he do that? You know, I've, I've talked about this in sermons before, and I've, I've always thought about this. So Jesus' custom on Shabbat, Sabbath, was to go to the synagogue. What do you suppose that it was like for Jesus to listen to a country rabbi trying to explain scripture? Because you know, all the skilled rabbis, they were down in Nazareth, where were they? They were in Jerusalem. So I mean, you've got, <clears throat> you've got, you've got the country rabbi here. So what could Jesus possibly have learned from the country rabbi trying to explain scripture to him? Or what was worship like in a synagogue like Nazareth or Capernaum? When Jesus had experienced the worship of myriads of angels in heaven. So since Jesus had all knowledge and wisdom, and there was nothing that country rabbi was going to teach him that he didn't already know, and he had experienced the worship of multitudes of the heavenly beings in heaven, why on earth would he make it his custom to go to synagogue? He wanted to. He wanted to worship God and to set an example for us. Wanted to worship God and set an example. Okay. He was showing. He was showing his subjection to God, and, and that's the theme throughout, up until his death. He is still subject to his God. <clears throat> that, that's a great, both of those are, are the answers to the question, by the way. And that, that's a great point. You know, in John chapter 5, Jesus said, you know, I, I are you kidding me? <laughs> well, that clock says it's only 20 minutes till 5. So by that clock, we got another hour. So we all settle in here. For a but, you know, in John 5, Jesus said, I, my will is to do the will of him who sent me. Remember what, <clears throat> what Jesus told the woman at the well curb in Sychar? The hour's coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. Look at that. The Father is seeking such to worship Him. And so this was the will of the Father. And Jesus would, would, would do that. You know, Jesus didn't have to be baptized for the forgiveness of His sins, right? But He said, we got to do what? we got to fulfill what? We've got to fill all, fulfill all righteousness. That's what this is as well. And as, as Don suggests, I, I think he wanted to be there. He wanted to be there with the people of God. This is what Hebrew people did. They gathered on Shabbat. They gathered in synagogue. This was important to them. And so it was important. <clears throat> it was important to Jesus as well. And so here's the point I want to make, and this is a good place for us to stop, is that he, he would do this because of what worship was ultimately designed to do. And so let's go ahead and just stop right there. And what we'll do Wednesday night is we'll pick up with what, what, is, what does the text say that scripture is designed to do, both as we offer that to God, but what benefit does that have to us? Because God designed it so that it helps us as well. And so we'll talk about that Wednesday night. Thank you all for your help tonight very much.